these are the best ones. Not only because they're interactive, I'm gonna learn a lot from the questions that you have. I learned a lot just about what's going on in Pennsylvania in the side conversation we have here, but also from you know, the diverse group of panelists. So I encourage you to ask as many questions as possible. I know we have a bunch kind of uh, pre-canned, but the preference would be if the entire room was just really interactive and give you as much uh, data as we can. Okay, and our last panelist is Scott Davis from the side team. Hello everyone, thank you guys for coming. Ladies, thank you for coming as well. Uh, I got started in cybersecurity going back 15, 20 years when I worked for a printing company that did printing for the Social Security Administration. And I learned kind of what the federal government required from that. I left there, spent five years at the Patriot News working infrastructure, and I've been with Intermix IT ever since. With Intermix IT, my current position is what we call a virtual chief information officer. So for those of you that are in larger corporations, enterprises, they have a CIO, that chief information officer. I pretty much do that for our clients. Um, I work together with one other person that does our alignment checks, which is pretty much dotting the I's, crossing the T's. But we're constantly reviewing the breaches that are happening, what the threats are, working on employee education, front and foremost, and really just doing everything we can to ensure none of our customers or ourselves end up as you know a news article of a breach. So uh, my first question, I'm gonna actually direct towards Devin and uh, also Scott. So uh, can you tell us about the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's recent ruling on the Dittman versus UPMC case and what that decision means for PA businesses? Sure, let me give a brief introduction and I'll let Scott talk about some of the details of what happened in that incident. So uh, Dittman versus UPMC, University of uh, Pittsburgh Medical Center was a, a decision from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court that was issued right around Thanksgiving of 2018, so coming up on about a year. Uh, and it involved, it was a class action lawsuit that was brought against UPMC by a group of employees and former employees who had had uh, their data accessed by unauthorized persons. And Scott, maybe you can give some details on how that incident arose, the, uh, the underlying uh, facts. Yeah, so like today, the most common factor where breaches occur is actually a simple email. It's that phishing type email or spear phishing, which is a more directed attack, where you're just trying to get information. You're trying to get the person to provide your email credentials, their LinkedIn credentials, their banking credentials, or just getting them to provide you information to help them form the puzzle of who you are and what the organization is. Once they have that access, they can get in there and they can immediately act. But we also see in some cases where they're getting in and they're sitting, they're creating an email filter that's sending keywords to an external email account, and they're just sitting and waiting for you to say, hey, I got a million dollar deal coming through. Hey, can you update my bank account information? In the case of the Dittman UPMT, it was likely called by a phishing email. Someone gave their credentials. It got either used immediately, sold on the dark web, someone then used the credentials that were provided to enable them access, find another vulnerability, find the server you want, find the information you want. Next thing you know, the employee data is breached and you're sitting in the PA Supreme Court. Yeah, and importantly, the, the categories of data that were accessed as a result of that breach included pretty much the whole array of sensitive personal information that your employer might have about you, including importantly, social security numbers, tax identification numbers, driver's license numbers, et cetera, uh, healthcare, uh, insurance information. And, um, you know, importantly, that information was actually used uh, in the Dittman, uh, in the Dittman scenario, was actually used by the hackers to commit tax fraud. So uh, a number of UPMC employees had fraudulent tax returns filed in their names, and uh, as a result, they either uh, didn't receive their tax returns in a timely fashion and had to go through a lot of uh, hoops to try to clear up the, uh, the fraud that had been committed. So there was actual identity theft that had occurred, which is not always the case in these uh, these data breach litigation cases. Uh, so the Dittman case started in the Allegheny County Court of Common Pleas. Uh, the case alleged a whole array of legal theories uh, that they alleged UPMC had promised to keep the employees' data secure, uh, but ultimately it became what we call a negligence case, meaning the employees alleged that the UPMC had failed to exercise adequate care to safeguard their personal information. Uh, and when the case started in the Allegheny County Court of Common Pleas, it went in front of a judge there called, named Judge Weddick, who's a pretty esteemed uh, trial judge in Pennsylvania. 
And interestingly, you know, Judge Wettig threw the entire case out. And the reasons he threw it out were essentially he said, if we recognize these kinds of claims against employers for breaches of employee data, we're going to have litigation like this in every instance where there's a data breach. And that's going to result in a flood of litigation, which will cripple Pennsylvania businesses because of the cost of defending the litigation. And it will overwhelm the Pennsylvania court system because there will be so many data breach cases, the courts won't be able to handle all the other litigation that they have to manage. Uh, and the case went up then on intermediate review to the Pennsylvania Superior Court, which agreed entirely with Judge Wettig. They, made, they sustained his dismissal of that case. But then the case went to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and there have been some shifts on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in the last few years uh, in terms of the judges elected to that court to become a much more uh, progressive court, liberal court, you might say. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court came out entirely the opposite of the two lower courts. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court in November ruled that employers in Pennsylvania have a duty, an affirmative duty, to exercise reasonable care to protect the personal information that they collect from their employees. And what this means realistically for a business is that if you suffer a data breach, and we'll talk about notification laws a little later, and you're required to notify your employees of that breach, any one of them could go to a plaintiff's attorney and say, I want to sue my employer over this. And from a legal perspective, we believe that those claims, at least initially, are likely to be successful because the court has already ruled you have a duty. The only question now in this litigation is going to be, did you violate that duty or did you exercise reasonable care? And that is a very fact-intensive question, right? Courts are gonna have to look at each scenario and look at uh, what kind of safeguards you had in place. Did you have a data security policy? Did you have adequate password uh, protection measures? Did you update your firmware uh, and your software regularly, right? All of these questions are gonna be have to be determined by your judge or a jury, which is going to make these data breach cases extremely, extremely expensive for Pennsylvania businesses to uh, defend. And you know, we're, we, we haven't seen yet the flood of litigation that Judge Wettig anticipated, but I do think that you're gonna see a tremendous amount of data breach litigation in Pennsylvania, Supreme, uh, Pennsylvania state courts going forward. All right. Uh, question over here. Is, what the stance Pennsylvania took is that in occurrence with the rest of the country, or was that a real? That's a great. That's a, that's a great question. It, you know, the, the the contrast between the decisions from Judge Wettig to the Supreme Court really mirrors the contrast we've seen in other states and in federal courts around the country. You know, in, in general, I would say the plaintiffs have been losing these cases, at least at the federal level, because. Uh, federal courts have looked very intensively at whether the plaintiffs in data breach cases have suffered any actual harm. So federal courts have largely said, uh, just alleging that your data was subjected to unauthorized access does not show any real harm, right? You don't have any real injury that we can, we can grant you a recovery for, and so we're gonna dismiss those cases. The Dittman case was different than that because the plaintiffs, the class plaintiffs, were able to point to actual identity theft that had occurred. And so they cleared that threshold of harm. But that wasn't the reasoning of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court didn't focus at all on that harm requirement. They, they really just focused on the fact that there's this duty of care and where there is a data breach, the employer is going to have to show that they had fulfilled that duty of care to their employees. And I'll just, I'll point out one thing, this is my speculation, but reading the Dittman decision, what it says about employers having a duty of care to their employees because they collect information for their business purposes, that same logic, I believe, can be extended to almost any commercial relationship, whether it's between a business and its customers, a uh, school and its students, a doctor and his patients, in any of those scenarios, you're collecting personal information that you need to use for your business purposes. And I think the reasoning of the Supreme Court could be applied in any of those scenarios. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see Pennsylvania cases that are consumer data breach cases where courts are uh, required to follow the Supreme Court's reasoning and 
you're going to have businesses across the gamut, even outside of the employer employment context, defending these kind of litigation matters. Uh, second question, I'm actually going to direct towards Scott. Uh, how do we defend against phishing attacks? So phishing attacks really focus on employee training. Uh, at the end of the day, your weakest link that you have in your entire information security plan is your employee. It's them that are sitting at the computer. It's that employee that's able to push the mouse button. It's that employee that's able to click that link. It's that employee that makes the decision to go to the website and not supposed to purchase. So it really comes down to just employee training and focus on that. Uh, we take an approach where it's both proactively and reactively. So we do simulated fish tests to all of the client emails that sign up for that service. And through that process, what they're doing is on a bi-weekly basis, they're getting a simulated phishing email. Some of them are really simple. It looks like a third grader wrote it. Some of them are a lot more advanced where it looks like an Intermix IT support ticket. And it says your ticket couldn't be completed. Click here to log in. Uh, so it's a whole gamut of different test methods. Um, the ones that are most popular and are the most successful centered around human resources. Um, hey, I'm applying for a job, open this Word file, open this PDF, that's a corrupt file. All day long, that person opens resumes. All day long, they're looking at those exact same file types. Do they know, if it comes up and says run macro, do they know not to run the macro? So it's really end user education. So the proactive side is that, then, you know, then we, or that's more the reactive side. The proactive side is cybersecurity training. We do an annual training of 30 to 45 minutes, and then we tie it in quarterly with additional training. So with that, if the, if the employee takes the initiative to open up a phishing email and plug in their information, what kind of liability then falls on that employee? And then also, is that obviously the, the company could be held liable because they didn't train that employee properly, but I mean, is the employee then, can they be sued, I guess, or could a company bring action? Uh, yeah, I, I would say the vast majority of phishing samples don't result in really any harm. It's someone looking for a vulnerability, someone trying to get information. Some of your most common is what C CEO fraud. It's that type of email that comes in. Hey, they have the president's name because it's on your website. Hey, can you do me a favor real quick? I'm in a meeting. The person replies, can you go to the Apple store, pick up 20 gift cards, and mail them to this address for me? You know, it's, there's a red flag somewhere. Um, having multiple tiers of security is there to protect your organization. Ultimately, protect the employee from the mistake. Mistakes happen. Uh, but it's having multiple tiers of protection, multiple tiers of security. So if that username and password is breached, you're limiting the risk of it. Uh, but as far as the legal side, sure. yeah. So the question about whether you can discipline the employee and what the ramifications are for the individual, you know, that's that's the reason companies need to have a data security policy that tells their employees what their expect expectations are with regard to safeguarding company data and telling them that they can be subject to discipline. And I'll, I'll, you, you talk about what the liabilities are. I always compare this scenario to sexual harassment, right? So your company almost certainly has a sexual harassment policy, right, that says we expect our employees to treat each other in a certain way. We're not going to tolerate any kind of abusive behavior or harassment. There's two reasons that companies have sexual harassment policies. Number one is because you want to have a good, productive, hospitable workplace, right? You really don't want people to treat each other poorly. The other reason companies have sexual harassment policies, though, is to avoid what we call vicarious liability. So if you have, uh, if you have a supervisor who is harassing one of their subordinates in the workplace um, and you don't have any sort of reporting mechanism uh, or any way for people, employees to complain and get redressed for that kind of behavior, well, then the company can be liable to the, the employee who's being abused. If you have a mechanism for employees to report sexual harassment, the company has a defense to say, hey, we didn't know about this. If they had followed our policy or reported it to us, we would have acted properly to stop it from happening. I think data security policies should be in place for exactly the same reasons. Number one, you want to inform your employees of the importance of the confidentiality of your corporate data. 
and you want them to know it's important that they respect the privacy of your customers and that they take reasonable steps to safeguard your information. But number two, you want them to know that if they violate that policy, they'll be subject to discipline up to and including the termination of their employment. So whether it's a rogue employee who's deliberately doing something, which is a scenario these guys I'm sure are very familiar with, or it's an employee who's simply negligent and when you're running your phishing tests, clicks on that phishing email three times, right? You wanna be able to discipline them in some way for that. And having uh, those stages of discipline and the standards set forth in a written policy is gonna protect your business if they bring some kind of wrongful termination case against you or anything like that. And that's why it's important to have a written policy addressing data security that goes into your employee handbook like any other policy. Yeah, I'll jump in with a, with a real life example. So, city of Norwalk, we're headquartered. I'm from about 100,000 people. We're doing a big school construction program, rebuilding uh, three or four schools. Uh, one of the construction managers, obviously they knew everybody in town knew where they were, it was in the papers. Uh, the finance department gets an email from them saying, hey, uh, you know, here's our August bill. Uh, we got a new wire, now we got a new bank account number, please wire it here. The woman did not follow any sort of protocol. Wired out $900,000. Next week, they get the actual invoice. That money's now long gone, and never going to get it back. Uh, the woman did not get fired. This was a, two years ago. She's still there because there was no, they couldn't prove that there was any kind of policy in place, which is crazy to be talking about that. But beyond that, the city tried to file an insurance game. They had a cybersecurity insurance uh, policy, but the, the policy did not cover something like that because that wasn't necessarily a breach with somebody sending money out. So it'll protect you from, and I guess there's probably other riders you can put in there, but it didn't protect them from somebody wiring out all this money, so the city was not able to recover it. Uh, they took it to court, I think they got a few hundred thousand dollars back, but I think that's close to a million dollars for a city of our size, it's a big hit. But that woman was not fired, she's still there today. It must be hard to walk the halls. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and public employees have a lot of extra protection, so if you don't have a real, you don't have an actual policy, it's going to be almost impossible to fire somebody in a public uh, yeah. I was just curious on that example. Didn't that send up any red flags at the bank? Uh, my bank won't let me wire funds without at least a, With, without a, you a know, second I don't know. I only know that signature authority or some other verification. So it actually happens more and more. No. I'll, I'll try to just jump in. There was a, a school district, I forget the city that it was being built. Uh, there was a normal bill. Uh, someone fished the email account, uh, changed the billing record of where the payment should go to. No one thought to call the person to question it. It was like $250,000 quarterly payment for the construction of the new school was sent. Uh, in the real estate market right now, it's very heavy, especially out in California. You have fishers that are actually attaching themselves into mailboxes and sitting and waiting, and they're waiting for that big real estate number to come in. You know, hey, I just sold a house for $10 million. Hey, you know, I just got the sellers. Hey, the seller, I'm pretending to be the seller. Hey, instead of that bank account, can you move the money into this one? And it sits there, and then the person's just like, oh, the money's coming. I just sold the house. It's going to take a couple of days. Um, there's also cases in the 401k industry. Uh, where the 401ks, the process is very antiquated, where the 401k provider will actually reach out to the person of record and saying this person's requested an early deposit, do you approve it? And in some cases, that person's not going to the employee asking, did you want this? They're just authorizing it. And there's people that are losing out of hundreds of thousands of dollars in their 401ks because normally you're not looking at that statement. And it's years after, you know, in some cases. Uh, the ones that are being public are, they're getting their annual statement and they're realizing six months, nine months ago they've been breached. So it all comes down to processes and understanding that anywhere that you have money, anywhere that you have data, it is a breach of, you know, waiting to happen. Uh, even if you think, you know, cloud services, you look at, it was Capital One, I believe, a couple weeks ago. Uh, they were breached. It wasn't data within their facility, it was data that they were hosting in Amazon Web Services. And now immediately Amazon comes out and says they're not responsible, it was a misconfigured you know, component of the protection. But really, if having a good understanding of where your data is at, how that data is secured, what data center is being stored in, it really falls down to you as a company owner, or you as an organization, 
to know where your data is at and how it's being protected. So if a breach happens, you can immediately take action and say, yes, my data was in there. This is the data that was there. Go and crawl. So, and just, you know, as to the bank and the red flags, right? The, under, in Pennsylvania and in all, almost every state, right, there's the Uniform Commercial Code which governs the, the transfer of money, right? The secure transactions. So, um, what that says is that the bank can set a procedure for approval of wire transfers, and as long as that procedure is agreed upon to the customer and followed, the bank <coughs> has no liability whatsoever for the transfer of funds. And what we see is, is Scott saying that these, these uh, hackers, fishers, are incredibly sophisticated, and they also get into these systems and sit there and watch the emails going back and forth. And so they figure out who's the approved person and what's the procedure. So let's say it's your CFO, right? They see that the CFO has unilateral authority to approve wire transfers and routinely does so. Then they just wait for the next large invoice or check that needs to be processed. They interject themselves into that transaction and, uh, and, and hope that the money's gone before anybody realizes it. I'll just say, I've had six cases in the last two months involving wire transfer fraud. I don't know if we want to jump into you know, wire transfer fraud specifically, but you know, we have uh, you know, cases where companies are out hundreds of thousands of dollars, either because their employee was negligent, or increasing what I'm seeing, because we represent some larger companies, is it's not my client who might be hacked, but one of their customers gets hacked. And when it's time to pay the $200,000 invoice to my client, someone interjects themselves and the customer instead pays the bad guys. And now there's a question about the customer says, I paid $200,000, but we didn't receive the $200,000. And we're seeing an increasing amount of litigation about who should bear the liability in those scenarios. And it's super unclear. There's really only two reported court decisions in that area nationally at this point. So it's going to be a big topic, I think, going forward. All right, uh, next question I'm going to direct for Mike and Dan. Uh, why should businesses have business continuity and disaster recovery plans in place? And uh, is data backups enough? Uh, well, as mentioned before, I mean, it, it is imperative that you have a disaster recovery plan. Uh, not just the, you know, for your business sake, but for all the regulations and things like that. You have to be able to show that due diligence. Um, in terms of having, when we, meet, when we meet business continuity, there's kind of a lot of layers to it. On the technology side, it means if something were to happen to your server, would you be able to stay up and running? Would you be able to keep, you know, continuous business operations? The reason why that's so important is when you're attacked, and whether it's a ransomware attack, which I'm sure we'll get into, or another attack, the big cost is the cost of downtime, is the fact that you're going to be down for a week or two weeks. A lot of businesses, especially at the SMB level, can't afford that. Uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper put out a study last year that said uh, a small business that is down for a week or more has a 71% chance of closing its doors within 12 months, which is a staggering number. And you can look at other reports and they're all in that range. So when you look at ransomware, where really all they're doing is encrypting your data and they're not stealing your data, the reason why people pay that ransom is Maybe they have traditional backup, which is gonna say, okay, I'm not worried that my data is not gonna be there because it's sitting there on an external hard drive or maybe sitting up on the cloud. The issue is gonna be how long is it gonna take me to get a new server in place, get all that data down into that new server and get back into a production environment. The criminals want you to do that math. And they want you to say, okay, you can pay me three grand. It's usually at a small business level, not a lot. Or go ahead and try to restore and be down for two weeks. That cost of being down is clearly going to be much more than the cost of actual ransom. So the, the business continuity aspect, and that doesn't necessarily even mean cyber attacks. It could be storms or fires or floods. That's what is much more costly than that risk of data loss. Now, stealing data is a different ballgame, but um, in terms of just lost data, which can occur with traditional backup, um, the downtime is always far exceeds the cost of the data. And looking at that, it's really, you're looking at how many employees are standing there that you're paying. Are they sitting at their desk just twiddling their thumbs? You know, what are your end users? You know, what is that labor rate that you're paying? You know, there's a lot of different numbers that go into attributing what your cost of being down is. And an important factor that when I talk to clients about is, what would you say your recovery time objective is? What is your RTO? How long can your organization or business afford to be down? Is it an hour? Is it four hours? I work with organizations that if we're down for a week, it's okay. 
But what is your RTO? And if your IT vendor, if your IT people don't ask that question, they, they really need to. And you need to explain to them what your expectations are. Yeah, most businesses that I talk to, they can tell you, yeah, we're backing up our data, we're doing it this regularly. Um, but when you talk about the RTO question, very few can answer it unless you're working with you know, an outside consultant who can come in. And so first and foremost, you gotta figure out what that is. And then you gotta say, is this aggressive enough that we need to change that? Again, there's some businesses you could be down for a week, depending on what you're doing. Other folks, an hour could cost you tens of thousands of dollars. And so you gotta figure out what, that, what your current situation is in your RTO and what it needs to be. And then there's, you know, it's when you talk to the team and they will figure out a solution for you. Don't ask what your RTO is when you're down. All right. It's ask amazing. me for. Well, most people do. Okay. Well, we got this. How long is it going to be? Yeah. Right. What do you mean it's going to be six hours? Yeah. I got 10 terabytes in the cloud. I'm going to try to pull that down over. Yeah. 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 How dangerous can it be? And the second part is, if I get affected with ransomware, uh, do I have any other options other than paying the ransom? So ransomware is a malware. It's no different than any other virus. The difference is, is ransomware is coming in and it's encrypting your files. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone in the room has heard of it. I mean, ransomware is a mainstream word. Uh, it's probably in the dictionary if it's not already. Um, but it, that's really what it is. Ransomware typically comes across, somebody sends a phishing email, gets somebody to click a link, and that's how it's delivered. Uh, there are cases that ransomware is delivered via images and email. There are cases that it's delivered over images on you know, just a standard website that is normally a safe website. So ransomware can come in in multiple different ways. And it's what is done once ransomware is downloaded really are those first steps of action. If you have a good business continuity and disaster recovery plan, you have backup. So ransomware is not a big deal because we find the computer that's attributing it. It's easy to locate that if you know what you're looking for. And we attribute to what workstation it is. We have them unplug the cable. Do not power the computer off. Powering off the computer typically triggers the attacker to run scripts that will eliminate logs and tracing files. So for forensics after that, to determine if they took data, it's important not to turn the computer off. So unplug the computer, the network cable. Um, from there, we see that the you know, attack has now stopped. At that point, we initiate the recovery of the files, and you're typically back up within an hour or two if you have the tools in place. Utilizing the data agent with the majority of the file servers, we're backing up data every 15 minutes. The data tool has a ransomware detector that will alert us if the data picks up ransomware. That's outside of the other alerting mechanisms that we have in place that we utilize to proactively identify what's going on in the network. Does it say ransomware is never going to come in? No, because really the click of a button can bring it in. But having the tools to identify it, knowing the process to remediate it immediately, and then go into the forensics and the recovery piece to get you back up and running as quickly as possible. Yeah, I'll say, uh, and that's a very good description of what ransomware is, right? So they're just holding your data ransom. They're not actually stealing your data, um, which allows them to cast this very large net. You know, we talk about stealing data that's very important, personal data, financial data. So there's a lot of small businesses that say, well, I'm not handling that. I don't have to worry about it because I'm being attacked. With ransomware, they don't care what your data is. It doesn't matter to them. They just know that you're going to pay to get it back because you can't operate without it. So it allows them to go way up market and attack cities like Baltimore and Atlanta and ask for a lot of money, swing for the fences, or you have the singles hitters that says, I can infect a thousand small businesses, and a lot of those are gonna pay because of that stat I just mentioned from Price Waterhouse Cooper, they're gonna pay to get their data back. And so it, it, that's the scary part of it. That's why, I mean, they said, the, the FBI said last year about a billion dollars changed hands alone between the small business community, this is worldwide, and these criminals, a billion dollars. It's a corporate structure. You can go onto the dark web and you could buy these viruses like it's a franchisee program. And they've got tech support on the dark web. So the folks that are creating it normally aren't even doing the attacks. They're, they're basically outsourcing it to these people that are gonna go do those attacks. And we give them so much information about our business on things like LinkedIn and things like Facebook and Twitter that when they send that email out, it's not the email from your long lost uncle saying, hey, give me $10,000 and I'm gonna leave you in your will. 
it's going to look like it comes from a vendor or a coworker or, or somebody that you used to work for. So when the email comes in, again, it's, you're so apt to click on it. And so that's why it's so prevalent, and it's it's actually accelerating those you know, things to go up. But again, to combat it, the idea is, all right, how quickly can you restore your data? And then you start doing the math, and you say, I can get back up and running in a half an hour, or an hour, two hours. Well, then it makes sense for me not to pay it. It's also, you're asking for this money in Bitcoin. Once you have a Bitcoin account, you've got to go find an exchange, fund it. It's not walking into your Wells Fargo to get $3,000. It, it can take a while. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, from, uh, just from working with companies. I mean, how many of you, let's say there's a ransom of five Bitcoin to recover your systems. How many of your companies have five Bitcoin uh, available, readily available? Uh, the first thing I do is call, call in an IT vendor like Intermix because they're going to be able to assist you with that whole part of the process. And then the other thing I'll just add is, from the legal side, the only thing I need to know in a ransomware case really is, was it just ransomware or was there an exfiltration of data? Because, you know, ransomware used to just be ransomware, but, you know, I was on a panel with uh, one of the guys from the FBI field office of Philadelphia, and he said, there's a lot of ransomware variants now that will dwell on the system for six months or more. And during that entire time, they may be uh, transferring data out of your system, which might include personally identifiable information. And then the ransomware attack happens, and it deletes log files that would have revealed what was going on that entire time. So we, you, know, you really need a qualified IT security vendor who's going to be able to figure out what happened. Otherwise, you might be overlooking legal obligations to notify people that you've actually had a breach that's reportable either to the individuals and notification, or if you're a regulated industry, you might have obligations to report to uh, the government. Yeah, to that point, I mean, I've heard that, that that is the trend now. So they will go in and they will infiltrate the uh, infiltrate network, sit dormant, steal some information, and they detonate that ransomware attack. And not only is it deleting files, but a lot of companies that aren't working with outsourced, but they'll just say, okay, I gotta, I gotta wipe this clean. Now you've just destroyed all your evidence. You can't do any forensics anymore. So, you know, that's why, like, moving it over, getting your business up and running, and then taking a look into those is critical. Yeah, we are seeing more and more of that, especially FBI's warning about it. Yeah. Actually, I have a question. So, with the data backup, let's say you have ransomware sitting there for six months, and you're taking a backup every 15 minutes, how are you thwarting that ransomware from just essentially being re-implemented into your system when you're reinstalling your backups? So with Datto, uh, there's a ransomware detection alert. So as soon as it's kind of notified that it's there, as the IT company, the first thing I'm doing is turning off the backups. So if it's not automatically turned off, you know, I'm going in, I'm turning it off, we're remediating, we're finding out what's going on. So it's really, it's having alerts set up to notify you when things like that happen. It, and ultimately having the team there that knows what to do. Yeah, and just to uh, go a little bit more into technology, still at kind of a high level. So each one of those backups, you mentioned the 15-minute backups, they're all independent of one another. So that one backup will be affected. But it'll be triggered. There's no risk of it impacting previous backups, which goes back to that layered, uh, that traditional uh, backup question four, where they're typically layered upon previous backups. Um, there's also the question of, okay, if it is affected, how do I know it won't get to the data center? We've got our own data center. We actually have one here in uh, Reading, which is not too far, and then one out in Salt Lake City. We've got military-grade encryption on the way to the data center and at rest of the data center. Data, that encrypted data won't get through an encrypted pipe, so it will not get up there because it's, it can't be re-encrypted twice. Um, so those are kind of the ways. But you do have to be proactive. There's nothing you can really do if you're not getting alerted to it. It's going to continue to back up encrypted data. That's just any backup is going to do. So being proactive is key. And there's more tools than just our ransomware detection tool. I'm sure you guys are using it. Absolutely. And one of the things, you know, typically when an attacker's coming in, they're going to look at ways to disable the backup solution that you have. Because the more tools that they can disable, the more likely it is that you can't get back up as fast. And then that cost of getting back online is more in favor of paying the ransom. Because at the end of the day, that's the quickest way for them to get a buck. And then that quick buck is pay the ransom. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to go ahead. So on that note of ransomware, this is uh, going to be dead. Um, we've not even come up with but what other legal ramifications is there for losing customer, client, EII, or PHI um, for HIPAA? What other legal ramifications are that? Let's take that one now. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, um, the in, in the regulatory 
every ski in the United States historically has been really focused on what happens after the breach rather than proactively what you need to do to protect data. So as of last year, all 50 states have breach notification laws. Um, and each of those laws requires that you notify your customers or employees or any other individuals from whom you have collected personally identifiable information if you suffer a breach of an electronic database of that information. Now, the, the issue is that's 50 different state laws and they're not all the same. They vary in important aspects. I mean, number one, what is personally identifiable information? In Pennsylvania, the definition is very limited. It's name plus social security number, driver's license number, or financial account number. That's it. So if you've got a breach of uh, health insurance information, that might be a HIPAA issue, which I'll get to in a second, but it's not, a, it does not trigger a notification obligation in Pennsylvania. But in like 26 other states, health insurance information is covered by the state breach notification law. Uh, biometric information, like fingerprints, uh, is covered by breach notification laws in many states. So in each of these instances where the client comes to us and says, for whatever reason, there's been unauthorized access to our electronically stored information, the process for us legally is I need to know uh, what categories of information were accessed and the state of residence of each of the affected persons. And then we need to go and look at each of the breach notification laws of each state of residence of the affected person. So if you've got customers in 46 states, we need to cross-reference the categories of their information that were either stolen or accessed against those breach notification laws. Uh, other important ways those laws vary are what is the trigger, right? Pennsylvania, it's if you uh, reasonably believe there's been unauthorized access to electronically stored information, and it is that it is likely to result in harm to the individual. So in Pennsylvania, we can sometimes say, listen, this was inadvertent, uh, it was our qualified vendor got into the wrong database, and so they weren't technically authorized to access it, but there's no real risk of harm here. But other states don't have that bailout of risk of harm. They say if there's any unauthorized access, you have to notify. Um, and so, and then the, the laws vary significantly in how long you have to issue the notification. Pennsylvania, it's within a reasonable period of time, whatever that means. Uh, it, it, uh, and it, Pennsylvania allows you to delay notification if you're cooperating with law enforcement. Uh, other states require notification as short a period as, as five or 10 days. Um, then you've got international laws. Uh, the EU's new general data protection law requires notification within 72 hours to any customers or employees or any other persons you might have who reside in Europe. Uh, and then o overlying that state breach notification scheme in the US, you've got uh, federal laws, which are really industry sector laws like HIPAA for healthcare providers, Gramm-Leach Wiley Act for uh, banks and financial institutions, uh, FERPA for schools, right? In those industries, there are federal laws and you're gonna be required to notify federal regulators of an incident. I'll tell you the craziest breach notification law that I know of currently in effect is the U.S. Department of Education has taken the stance that a uh, any uh, post-secondary uh, college or university that accepts federal student aid money needs to notify the Department of Education of a known or suspected breach of student information within 24 hours of discovery of the incident. So, you know, if you're a college or university, I mean, you know, known or suspected, right? So we suspect there might have been unauthorized access, but before we can even investigate and determine the scope of the incident, we need to notify the Department of Education. And that's the case. They've taken the stance that you can be fined and face other sanctions under FERPA if you fail to uh, if you fail to notify, notify the Department of Education within 24 hours. And just to kind of piggyback there, if you think about what data you're storing locally, if you think you're probably doing healthcare for your employees, so you technically have healthcare related information, which if you're storing it electronically, is making your organization HIPAA, you know, under HIPAA for that file that you're storing. If you're taking credit cards, you have PCI DSS. Uh, so if you're processing credit cards in any fashion, even if it's all through a third party, you still have PCI DSS. Uh, a lot of the companies that we walk into that are new with us, I start asking these questions, 
Be like, oh, there's a $20 fee they charge me for not being PCI compliant every month. And it's just a piggyback fee. Uh, it takes very little time to go through what they call the SAQ survey and complete it and become, you know, at least to the point that you're compliant and you understand the terms. Okay. The majority of compliance has come down to documentation. And if you're not taking the time, we talked earlier about having a cybersecurity policy, a data use policy, you know, if you don't have the basic stuff documented, then immediately when they come in to levy whatever client it is, they're going to look at what steps have you taken, what documentation have you created, you know, and the less you have, the higher your clients, especially in the HIPAA industry, the HIPAA side. Yeah, just to add beyond regulations, um, there was a, an article, there's a, a small medical office out in Michigan uh, earlier this year that was hit with ransomware. They had no protection in place. They, they weren't gonna be compliant at all. They just shut their doors. They weren't able to get any of that data back and they shut their doors, leaving their clients, all their clients record encrypted. They didn't pay the ransom. It wasn't even a lot of money. I want to say it was like $8,000 and they closed their doors. I don't know what the repercussions, I don't know, can they go back? after they close their doors, if they're in violation, is there anything they could do to the doctors themselves, or are they protected because of the corporate entity? No, I mean, the, 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 some of the strongest fines you see in this area are from the Department of Health and Human Services for violations of HIPAA, and that's in part because HIPAA is one of the oldest privacy laws, and so, you know, the federal government expects at this point that healthcare providers and insurers and those who process health and insurance information are going to be compliant with that law. So you, know, you see tons of uh, disciplinary, or sorry, enforcement actions by HHS against doctors, hospitals, insurers, and employers alleging they failed to safeguard that kind of information. And it can carry on uh, if the company closes its doors, but there's a successor entity that's purchased either the business or its assets, they can be liable under that. Um, you see this against uh, you know, doctors who lose devices, laptops, and let I me, mean, you know, we, we're really focused today on electronically stored information, and uh, these guys are telling you about, IT, you know, from an IT background, uh, how to protect things on your computers. But while we're talking about HIPAA, I'll point out that paper documents that contain personally identifiable information or protected health information are covered by these laws as well. Not in Pennsylvania, where our breach notification law just talks about electronically stored information. But in many other states, if it's in paper form, you uh, are required to notify and subject to enforcement actions if you fail to protect that information. Real quick story, I represented a client. They were a, a moving company. They were hired by a uh, healthcare provider who had just bought a, a chain of uh, 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 PT clinics, uh, physical therapy clinics down in Texas. So they bought like 30 clinics around West Texas. They consolidated, closed 15 of them, hired this moving company to go down and clear out all the, uh, the equipment and uh, other stuff from the closed clinics. So the uh, moving companies down there in Texas, uh, they're clearing out one of these clinics. They're moving you know, tables and chairs and desks and they're throwing the broken stuff into the dumpster behind the unit. Uh, later that day, after the moving company has left, a uh, sheriff's deputy in this small town in Texas is driving by and he notices that people are scavenging in the dumpster, pulling out broken desks and chairs and stuff and taking them home, throwing them back in pickup trucks. The guy goes up to the dumpster, he runs these people off, he notices some paper rolling or fluttering around the ground. The deputy picks up a piece of paper off the ground. He sees it's an invoice from this physical therapy company. Uh, he notices that it has a patient ID number, a social security number, and uh, information about the diagnosis that was being treated on this piece of paper. So this local sheriff's deputy goes to the sheriff, shows it to him. The sheriff calls the Texas Attorney General's office. The Texas Attorney General's office comes in and finds uh, that company that had bought those PT clinics and closed them, uh, finds them a million dollars for failing to comply with Texas law regarding protection of healthcare information just because those paper documents were not uh, were not adequately controlled during the close down and move of those facilities. So, you know, those are the kind of things that happen to regular everyday companies on a routine basis. Is that fine a deductible expense of operations? Uh, yeah, that's, I'm not a tax guy, so <laughs> you talk to your CPA or your tax attorney. I, I, I don't know, I don't know whether you can the, fine, the fines are going up. Uh, GPDR is setting records with some of the fines. Uh, HIPAA has set records this year on some of the fines it's established. So I mentioned getting ransomware, spending the money to remediate ransomware, 
spending the money on the new infrastructure you have to do to you know get now protected and then at the end of it you get a little you know certificate in the mail saying this is how much your fine is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so is the new company liable for that fine or was the moving company liable? The, 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 well uh, so the new company the company that was that owned the information because they had bought the PT clinics was fine and then there was years of litigation against the logistics and moving companies about who should who should be liable, um, and eventually ended the settlement. Uh, a lot more that question about deductions, so I'll, I'll maybe talk about cyber insurance for a quick second, right? So, um, how many of you, how many of you know that your company has a cyber insurance policy? Okay, most of you, which is good. Uh, it's very important. It's also very important that you shop around and understand what the scope of coverage you have. Is because a lot of the different things we've talked about today, wire transfer fraud being a great example, are not covered under many cyber insurance policies. So we have a lot of examples of uh, wire transfer incidents where uh, the company says, yeah, we have a cyber liability policy, but that cyber liability policy, as Scott was talking about in an earlier example, only protects you against external threats. So if you have an internal issue where an employee uh, if mistakenly wires money to the wrong person, that needs to be covered under a crime policy, right? So talk to your agent, make sure your agent knows enough about cyber insurance uh, to know what kind of coverages are available, and make sure you've got adequate coverage across the board. Ransomware, another example, a lot of businesses opt out of, uh, of, of coverage for ransomware attacks, and then they don't have uh, the options we've talked about to try to remediate those. What is your suggested top three coverage models? Uh, I, well, the, I, I won't make a personal recommendation, but the leaders in the market are probably Beasley is number one, uh, and Chubb at, at number two. The last time I talked to my agent about cybersecurity insurance, he said since it was such a new market that there, the policies hadn't been fleshed out because there hadn't been challenges, legal challenges to them between the policyholder and the insurer. Yeah. And has that changed at all? I mean, it's like, probably two years since I discussed it with him, is that? Well, it's still true that there hasn't been a lot of litigation that's flushed these things out, but it's uh, the market is significantly more developed, I would say, probably even just in two years. And in fact, what's happening is all these insurers are trying to grab up market share, so they're all offering really broad policies and competing with each other. And it's, so it's not that expensive. Um, but again, make sure, you're, you know, don't go down the street to the you know State Farm guy who does your CPL or your health insurance. Talk to an insurance broker or agent who specializes in cyber coverage and knows what they're talking about because it is an emerging sector in that industry and a lot of folks don't know what's available. Yeah, I think I've sat on a lot of panels with different cybersecurity agents and I completely agree with you. There's some that you can tell they're, they're insurance agents and they sell a big broad, broad range of products and there's some that have been focused on this for years. I have no idea how they underwrite those stuff, how difficult it must be to underwrite that cyber policy, but it is more mature and it is getting better than it was two years ago. You can tell in those conversations. So um, I would do some research. It's all you know, localized, but I would do some research on some of those companies that have been in that space for a while and understand it and then walk you through all of those different options about whether you should be having uh, you know, ransomware protection or not based on your, your size of your company and all that. And just like with technology, technology is constantly evolving. So the threats of today, you know, phishing being one of the most uh, you know, prevalent, but you know, what is the threat tomorrow? You know, is it text message phishing? Is it the Microsoft tech support phone calls? Uh, you know, there's always another way. They're going to find another way to breach it. They're going to find another way to break your security. Uh, there's a lot of cartoons out there in the cyber, you know, security realm of I'm doing all this, we're dumping all this money to protect this, and the hackers are sitting on the other side, and I just walk right in the door and plug in. So it's you have to look at every aspect of security, almost to the point that you're taking 25 steps back and looking at it as a whole picture to really get an understanding of where you need to put your attention and focus. And that's where you rely on a company like Intermix IT to be able to come in and really identify where your weak points are, establish those weak points and strengthen them, but also say, hey, have we thought about this side of it? Have we thought about this? <laughs> Okay, I'm directing this one to Scott. Uh, should employees have a complex password policy and password management, or is a password protected Excel, Excel spreadsheet good enough? Uh, how many people use this Excel to store their password? Be honest. 
right, I, got, I, I, knew, I knew I was going to get two or three. How many have you used Outlook to store passwords? I've seen people store passwords in Outlook files. Um, I've seen Word documents. I've seen uh, everything known to man. I use one example. There was the missile threat coming into Hawaii that went out all the social media. It was a huge ordeal, if you don't really call it. They were doing a TV broadcast from Hawaii's Department of Emergency <coughs> Management, and the computer behind the interviewer that was speaking had his password on the bottom. A little post-it note with his password, <laughs> and the username. <laughs> so, your password's there. Um, I used to walk around and lift up deck, you know, keyboards and change people's screensavers to the football team they hate the most. Uh, just, you know, hey, your password needs reset, you know, emails. But there is Excel, Word, they are not a suitable form. Uh, you can get, there's tools out there, a key pass, one password. Uh, we can offer a tool through us that allows you to kind of have a password manager. Uh, are they 100% secure the answer? Yes and no. Uh, if you're getting one that's cloud-based, there have been cloud-based ones that have been actually attacked and keys have been taken out of that. Uh, and if someone has the master unencrypt code, you know, and how they encrypt, then your information that you have in that tool is just as vulnerable. <coughs> Typically when I talk about passwords, I say you want to find anywhere between four and five passwords uh, that you use on a regular basis. Your work password should only be used for work purposes. If it's a work-related thing, that's the password you use. It gets changed on the company policy of how often you change the password. You should have one that's just social media. Social media is one of the biggest things people are looking to attack and breach. Have one that's just for social media, change it six months every year, change that one, not as frequently. Have one for your financial institutions. My financial password I change every 30 days. Because if someone gets that, you know, they're getting into multiple accounts. They're getting into, you know, really my financial identity and the breach capability and you know, the loss of money, income. Uh, then I have kind of a password for everything else. You know, that random website I had to sign up for that had no purpose in life. You know, I thought it was the next big thing or that shopping site, you know, and changing that on a less frequent basis. But you can take all your passwords and you can theme them. Uh, if you like Navy battleships, you know, choose four different battleships, you know, I got SSS George Washington, I got this one, this one, and just make all your passwords battleships. You know, for that 90 days, for that 180 days, it's all battleships. So you know what your four favorite battleships are. Um, Civil War forts, spaceships, you know, this is the old naming convention IT nerds used to use in naming the servers. You know, I'd call it like Polo, I'd call, you know, you know Sputnik. Uh, so it's really that same mentality, but it's using to secure your passwords. Now you can't just use the word, you know, if there's an A, use the at symbol. If there's a one or an L, use the exclamation mark. If there's an E, use a three. So finding common letters, throw an abbreviation in, make it secure. Every password should have, you know, three of the four complexity, number, letter, uppercase, symbol. So make them complex, but find a term. Disney movies, Disney princesses, if you're into Disney princesses. There's a million ways you can look at it. NIST uh, is a national institute of standards uh, at the federal level. They're right now recommending passwords less frequently changed, but of a longer complexity. So 16 characters or 14 characters, I believe, is their recommendation. The longer the password, it's harder to decrypt uh, if it is taken. So having an understanding of what you know that length is, my belief really comes down to just Simple, stupid, you know, let's be realistic. How many of you just add a one to the end of the password when it's time to change it? Or a two, you know, the next month, or a three the next month? Microsoft is starting to put safeguards in, so you can't <coughs> just make it simple, stupid. Uh, and that's when you have to try to find a simple, stupid solution that works for you. And that's really where the theming idea comes in. You know, they use, you know, NIST says passphrase, you know, come up with a little riddle, you know, my kid Scarlett goes to first, you know, and try to choose keywords out of there so you know the phrase and you're picking the keywords. And that's what makes it 14 to God knows how many characters. So password complexity is always going to be. Um, we have tools that we can deploy on the network that tell us, you know, when your login account has been used and there's been a false login uh, or a failed login, 
We can have it set up that that tool automatically emails you every failed login. So if you're sitting on the beach drinking your margarita and you did not try, immediately just forward that email to Intermix IT and we take action. You know who logged in, what IP address did it come from, what computer tried to log into. So there's tools out there that can identify that password stuff. How do you guys feel about the use of uh, either individuals using or businesses permitting the use of password managers? Using a password manager that's a company? Yeah, like, well, like, how do you feel about whether a company should let people use LastPass or whatever, or what should people use them? What do you think? Uh, right now, one of my customers said, hey, we want to install LastPass for a couple of years. I'm going to say do it, because right now they're storing it in Excel, and nine that's times out of 10, thing. Excel doesn't even have a password. So it's understanding kind of, you know, is this being cloud safe? You know, how strong is the password to get into LastPass? So there's questions that I always ask, but I'd rather you use a password manager than use Excel or the notebook. I would say, and I don't know, uh, speaking to how you handle your clients, but I would just say I wouldn't let uh, coworkers just use it on their own. It should be a standardized, this yes. is the one we use for our company, instead of saying, hey, you're in charge of protecting your passwords, do whatever you want, you know. Um, when you look at the, the password, you know, people stealing the passwords, most people think, okay, they're gonna know my maiden name and these things. It's all bots and machines just scam scamming through it. That NIST uh, recommendation of 16 uh, letters and having random phrases, if you have eight or less, and it's just something simple, even if you are using ampersand or exclamation points, they can normally, these bots can get in there in a matter of minutes. If you, every letter that you expand, the number goes crazy, and if you get to that 16 with those and you're hitting all four of those, it's like 100 years with the fastest. Now we're gonna, you know, I'm sure that's gonna speed up, but those are the type of things, so it is very important. I will also tell you that I'm sure just about everybody in the room, if not everybody in this room, does have on the dark web one of their accounts and their passwords down there, because I've seen dark web scans. I've never sat through a dark web scan demonstration where they haven't found somebody, at least within that domain. So they will sit there, and, and so it will sit there where it will say, I have, this gentleman, Mike De Palma, is 39, here's his email address, here's his password. That password is probably the same thing for his bank accounts. Is you know, like that's what they're gonna assume. And they sell it on the dark web. Those people that are stealing it normally aren't the ones doing the attack. They say, this guy, here it is for 200 bucks, it's yours, and then the next wave, it's really looking for corporate structures, and that guy goes and mines it, does all these things. So that's why it's key to change it, because it's probably sitting somewhere right now on the dark web. If you want an illustration of that, there's a website, haveibeenphoned.com, phone, P-W-N-E-D, and if you go to Have I Been Phoned, you put in your email address, and it'll show you in how many different reported data breaches the password connected with that email address was compromised. So you, it's, it's uh, haveibeenphoned.com, uh, P-W-N-E-D, phoned. I just signed uh, yesterday with the new cyber uh, insurance company because our old uh, term was up. And it's called the Coalition. They actually have a, a, a web page to go to that lets you sign up for the policy and there's a, a dashboard. Different things that they monitor. They monitor our, our domain, uh, if anybody's redirected anything from our domain. two different ways. Uh, we, look, we monitor the domain, and as soon as there's a hit, it notifies us via ticket. We notify the point of contact, and typically it's delay. But we also monitor your IP addresses. So IP addresses can be used as botnet servers uh, or point in, or command servers. And a lot of times uh, in the dark web, what, there's, what you're seeing more and more of is they're actually deploying the agent that's sitting there, and then they're selling access to that. On the dark web. So your server has the agent on there, and multiple different hackers now are being are buying, you know, for dollars, the right to use your server to run a you know, ransomware campaign. Um, I'm actually going to direct this one to Mike. Excuse me, um, Mike. Explain the difference between a data backup solution and all the common other backup yeah. solutions. Yeah. Versus tape versus yeah. So there's still a lot of companies using the traditional form of tape backup. I still still see that uh, traditional kind of you know USB or, or external hard drives or just straight to the cloud. What those 
all those backups are doing, they're backing things up at the file and folder level. So you're going to tell that device or whatever that backup solution is to back up certain files and folders. For the most part, it does its job. Uh, business continuity instead is a full snapshot. They're backing up your server. We're capturing not just those files and folders, but the operating systems, applications, everything. So that image is now mirrored over to an on-premise device with a little one sitting up here somewhere. Um, or, and then it gets replicated to those two data sets. So now you have three copies of that data, a full image of that data. So then you set up a schedule um, where you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna back it up hourly. All of those data points, as I mentioned, are all independent of one another, whereas a lot of those uh, traditional backups are layered upon previous backups. So if you are infected, there's a chance of that entire machine getting infected. Um, but it gives you the ability to virtualize, and this is the key. We were talking about downtime before, an RTO. Because everything that lived on that server lives on this on-premise device, this server is <coughs> impacted for whatever reason. Maybe it's a hardware failure, maybe it's a cybersecurity attack, maybe it is a fire or flood. Since everything that lived on there lives on that on-premise device, you would spin up what's called a virtual machine, and everybody that was connected to this uh, server is now going to be operating off of this on-premise device, and it's a production environment. You're taking backups in this space. You could be in that space for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and you're, you're, it's really an easy, I guess, again, business continuity, keeping your business up and running. Then when you're ready, you got a new piece of hardware, you do what's called a bare metal restore, get all of that data back to that new piece of hardware. You can start that process while you're still virtualized, and you've gotten all your data back, and, and not just to where you were when you were attacked, but to where you were right when you wanted to start that restoration. The same capabilities have, are available in the cloud. Hurricane Sandy, we had thousands of businesses operating out of our data centers for weeks as their server rooms were being you know, drained out and new racks were being put in. And at the end of the day, we were able to restore all that data. So that's the big difference. When we're talking about the cost of the downtime, before you even start that restoration, let's just get everything back up and running. Like as Devin said, then you can go in and do those forensics. And instead of shutting down your business while you're doing those forensics, we're over here, you're, everybody's just operating. Most people in the office won't even know that that change over especially if it's on a local device. So I don't know, I mean, you've done more actual uh, virtualizations probably on your side, is that? Uh, I can say we've never had to go to the cloud virtualization. Uh, we've done the virtualization you know, in test scenarios on a regular basis uh, for a number of the high profile clients. Uh, but I have clients that are in hurricane zones uh, down in Florida that you know their business you know, thrives on a hurricane. The last thing that they would need during that situation is not to be able to function. So data gives you that capability, and that's ultimately why we prefer, you know, and recommend data the highest to our customers. Are there any questions about that kind of virtualization process? It, it's really everyone's used to the traditional that you know I'm backing up my data, I'm backing up my data. Well, to get your data back from the cloud, uh, if I use Carbonite. For example, Carbonite's a big personal backup solution. They have it more bandwidth downloading into their data center, so a faster upload from you, than they do an upload speed back to you. So it may take a couple, you know, 15 minutes to upload your computer to them. It's gonna take four to five hours to download that data from them. And most business continuity places or backup places are exactly the same. If you're relying just on cloud backups without the business continuity capabilities, then you're really looking at a long time recovery objective. And it's hard to answer that question because you're not going to be able to test that. In terms yeah. of a, you know, virtualization on, a, on an on-premise device, you could test it in a sandbox bar and say, hey, it took us 45 minutes, we got all the systems back up. You can't call this and say, okay, let me practice sending all this data back. It's good, they're going to give you an estimate. It's typically, it's going to be faster for you to download your data back from a cloud solution by having them encrypt it onto a USB drive and shipping it to you. Uh, sure, yeah, over there. <laughs> uh, was there any other questions? Okay, um, just to let everyone know, uh, we can put Did one I try one, one more thing in okay. before you do that? Uh, last weekend, uh, and this is you know the last note I'm going to throw in, but last weekend there were 22 uh, municipalities in Texas that were briefed by a single attacker. And <coughs> I bring that up and I want to bring the topic to it because your IT vendor could be a breach point. Your human resources vendor could be a breach point. Your payroll company, uh, pay time a couple years, a local company was breached. Uh, so look at your vendors and what they do. There's a compliance called SOX2 compliance 
that actually requires you to ask questions of your vendors and what your vendors are doing to protect your data. Your IT company has to be one of those that you consider. At Intermix IT, two-factor authentication for all of our tools that we utilize. We take security seriously in-house, so we can deploy it for you in your house. And really just asking some basic questions of what is your vendor doing? Uh, I mean, after this, I can give you kind of a list you know, of basic questions to ask them, but just kind of what are they doing to protect you? Because in the state of Texas, it was a single point uh, they're not 100% sure what tool it was utilized to breach it. Uh, they're saying kind of the rumor mill is a unupdated version of Screen Connect, which is a tool that allows somebody to remotely connect into your computer. But one point of source allowed access to 22 different municipalities across the state. All 22 of those have ransomware. The FBI is investigating. Dell's helping with the recovery. So it's a big mess, and it's very recent. I just, I'll throw out one thing. If you do business in California or Nevada, they have new privacy laws that go into effect in November and January, respectively, that govern what data you can collect and what disclosures you have to give to your customers. So uh, if you're interested in hearing more about that, follow me after the presentation. Do you have anything you want to close with? <laughs> no, at all. Yeah. No, 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 no. One quick question back to Ransom. Are you recommending to your clients that they have a handful of Bitcoins just no. in case? No. Uh, worst case, I'm a nerd. I can find you some. Yeah. Um, so, but I wouldn't recommend it. I was on a panel once where somebody recommended everybody goes out and buy Bitcoins. I really think he was a short seller. Uh, he had a whole bunch. He wanted to see the price go up and sell. Uh, but, you know, if you're taking the right steps, having the, you know, preventative, the proactive, the being prepared reactively, you should never be in a situation that A, you need them, but B, if you're working with an IT company, uh, I guarantee I'm not the only one at Intermix IT that can help you find something. Plus Murphy's Law, if you buy five, you know they're gonna ask for yeah. six. Yeah. Yeah. Five and a half. Yeah. <laughs> solution out there, I'll breach it and I'll show you how to get the phishing email through. Uh, phishing creators are more creative than ever. Um, I use the example, if you walk into any one of our client sites, you're likely to see an Intermix IT mouse pad at the front desk. So if anyone walked in doing a kind of a physical, just trying to identify, you can identify that Intermix IT is their vendor. Or if you drive by and you see one of our cars sitting in the parking lot, if you send an email to support at intermixit.com, you're gonna get an email back of what our ticket platform looks like. So I created one that says, your ticket failed to create, click here. And it's amazing how many people thought they actually created a ticket. Um, so it's, it's easy to identify. And it's, unless it's coming from a reputable source, uh, well, you know, it's being able to identify. Uh, fishers are getting more creative. You can turn on functionalities like DMARC, which you know they claim can you know prevent up to 80% of phishing type emails. Uh, DMARC is a new emerging technology, but it requires you know, almost both sides to be utilizing DMARC for it to be effective, plus the 20% failure rate. Uh, but it's employee training, and it's always going to be, because once emails get to the point that it's 80, 90% effective, that it's blocking it, then they're gonna attack your text message, or your Facebook Messenger, or whatever the new thing is. On the flip side of that, there's um, things you can do with emails, even in Outlook, I think, that to, to, to put up a, a highlighted bar to show employees that they're sending messages outside of your organization. And from my point of view, 
A lot of the data breaches that my clients have been required to report and notify, sometimes tens or hundreds of thousands of people, have been just inadvertently an employee sends a spreadsheet and puts the uh, autocomplete in Outlook is a scourge as far as I'm concerned. They put in the first few letters it autocompletes to an outside the outside address and they don't notice and they send that spreadsheet and that's a data breach and it's reportable and it can lead to huge consequences. So, you know, I'm gonna figure out a way to stop that from happening and that'll be my billion dollar idea. Yeah. I'll go with it. Yeah. He <laughs> thought of it here. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? So in conclusion of this uh, workshop, I want to let everybody know that uh, in your bags you have a uh, offer for a free dark web scan. Please feel free to uh, take advantage of it if you can. Uh, secondly, I want to thank everybody again for attending. I hope you're getting some information out of this that you can use. And we'll be around after uh, to answer any other questions if you want to pull aside one by one. So thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.